Chief Justice Ma, Assistant Professor Blackwell, dignitaries in the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to the flagship lecture of the LSE-SUHA Pass, uh, featuring the Chief Justice of Hong Kong, Mr. Jeffrey Ma, on the subject, the rule of law of changing times. We'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Jeffrey Ma first, so let's give a round of applause to Mr. Jeffrey. <laughs> if we read the broadsheet in Hong Kong today, it would appear as if the rule of law is under attack from executive interference to widespread civil disobedience across Hong Kong in late 2014. It appears as if the prized legal institutions we have is under constant assault. But there are also those groups who say the rule of law is as strong as it's ever been, that the respect for the spirit of justice has awakened a group and the population that has been too apathetic to react and respond. But no matter our position on the political spectrum, I'm sure we'll all agree that we're very, very grateful that our legal institutions are led by one of the most widely respected figures of our time, Mr. Jeffrey Ma. I've had the privilege of meeting uh, the Chief Justice back in my time as a social entrepreneur, and I'm sure we'll all agree that aside from being an amazing leader in turbulent times, he is also a warm and very kind man. And I'm sure his contributions to this area will be very much appreciated. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our Assistant Professor, Mr. Michael Blackwell, our moderator today, to begin the event. Professor Blackwell, please. Thank you. know him very well. Um, he's the incumbent Chief Justice of the Court of Final um, Appeal in Hong Kong. Um, between, he was appointed to that position in uh, September 2010, and between 2001 and when he, his appointment to that position, he was a, a judge in the High Court of Hong Kong as a judge of the Court of First Instance, then a judge of the Court of Appeal, and um, also then Chief Judge of the High Court. Um, he was educated in the UK as well, um, getting his bachelor's in law from the University of Birmingham in 1977, completed his bar finals in 1978, and then called to the bar of Gray's Inn. Um, he's also a member of the bar of the state of Victoria in Australia, and of the bar of Singapore. Um, he was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1993, and is a venture of Gray's Inn and a Doctor of Laws of, at the University of Birmingham, um, and also an honorary fellow of Harris Manchester College at the University of Oxford. So a great pleasure to welcome him today, and it's our great privilege to have him here. With that, first of all, we look forward to the question from him. Great pleasure to be um, at LSE again. I, uh, when I became Chief Justice, I, I, I think a year into uh, being the Chief Justice, I did a sort of tour, and LSE was um, uh, one of the stops. And I, th I think it was, I could be this theater, I don't, rem I don't really remember. It was a pretty old and cold uh, theater. And I think, yeah, this is probably it, actually. So it's great to be uh, back again. Uh, I'm here, actually, for the Global Law Summit. Uh, which is a three-day conference organized by the British government to celebrate uh, Magna Carta. This year is the uh, 800 celebrations of the sealing uh, of Magna Carta. And that actually has some themes which are relevant to what I'm going to talk about uh, today and relevant um, to uh, Hong Kong. It's a pleasure to be at LSE because LSE has had a very strong um, commitment to the rule of law, um, Professor Geerty. Uh, and the Center, uh, I'm, I've, I've written here, Center for the Study of Human Rights, the Institute of Public Affairs, uh, are lasting commitments of the LSE uh, to the rule of law. Now, I'll give you a definition of rule of law a little later. The rule of law is relevant in all jurisdictions. My talk today um, centers on Hong Kong, but it actually is applicable to um, all jurisdictions, any jurisdiction you care to examine. Now, every jurisdiction, as far as I can see, has, if you like, challenges to the rule of law. They just come in different forms. In some places, there are challenges to the rule of law on something as basic as the judge's qualifications, whether judges are even legally qualified. There are some places where there's a question mark over the integrity of judges, 
In other words, are judges corrupt? Um, uh, challenges are met in the, uh, exist in the United Kingdom because recently, if you follow what goes on in the United Kingdom, there are perceived threats to the rule of law coming in two forms. The first is the legislation passed uh, by the UK government which restricts the right to um, be an applicant in judicial review. That was seen by many lawyers uh, as affecting the rule of law uh, to a significant level. The cuts in legal aid uh, seen as threats to uh, the rule of law. W why legal aid? Because uh, this is directly related to uh, a fundamental right known as the access to justice. In a perfect legal system, which doesn't exist, but in a perfect legal system where you have um, wonderful sets of laws which uh, uh, contain human rights, and you have independent courts and an, uh, an efficient judiciary which enforces those rights. Now, that's actually largely my definition of rule of law, but in that sort of perfect state of affairs, you must have access to it. Because in a lot of the cases that matter, um, all cases matter, I suppose, but uh, in the commercial type of case or in the tax sort of case, uh, where access is not a problem because uh, the litigants can secure the services of lawyers, well, uh, you would have access. But in a lot of cases, particularly those uh, sensitive public law cases which um, involve human rights, very often you can't get to court unless you have a lawyer, and you can't, well, secure the services of a lawyer because uh, that involves expense. This is where legal aid comes into it, and... Uh, therefore, the aspect of access to justice is an integral part uh, of uh, the rule of law. Now, in Hong Kong, James briefly mentioned challenges, uh, or not so much challenges to the rule of law, but questions being raised as to the rule of law emanating from events. Now, I'll deal with two events which took place over the course of last year. Uh, all of you from Hong Kong would be familiar uh, were those two events. But events happen every year which causes people to question, uh, or at least raise the question of the rule of law. The two events of last year are first June, 19, uh, June 2014, uh, the publication of uh, a document known as the White Paper, which was issued by the State Council uh, of the People's Republic of China, setting out the views of the State Council uh, on um, uh, on the constitutional model for Hong Kong of one country, two systems. The two points of concern in that document were references made to judges uh, as administrators, as opposed to judges, because normally you don't uh, uh, refer to judges as administrators. We're not civil servants. You administer the law, but you're not administrators uh, in the way that perhaps it was meant. The second part was... Um, a sort of requirement or a desire that judges should be patriotic. Um, uh, now, pa again, patriotism is not something which you associate readily with judges. Now, everybody is patriotic to different, for different reasons. You are patriotic because of a football team. You are patriotic well, because you love your country, well, that's, that's, that's fine. But when you talk about judges having to be patriotic, if you mean it in the sense of support your football team or, or, or support them at the Olympics, that's one thing, that's not what it's meant. The, the worry is that our ah, judges in being patriotic are asked in the discharge of their professional duties as judges to exhibit a bias towards an institution or an entity. Uh, 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 usually a bias towards, let's say, the government uh, of the day. In order to be patriotic, you support the government. And in everything that you decide, uh, rather than act wholly independently, you act with a bias towards that institution. Now, that was the worry, these two worries, which stemmed uh, from the white uh, paper. And that co uh, the, the, the second event, of course, was the Occupy uh, movement. The Occupy movement, which lasted now, who's going to tell me how many days it lasted? Anybody? Anybody? Who's shy? Dixon? 
right in the middle there in the pink shirt. Is that your name? I, I'm just taking a rough guess. <laughs> The exact figure actually was 78. It is, it is over two months, but uh, less than uh, three months. Now, that was a movement in which you, you know what it involved. It involved uh, um, students and other people occupying the streets. At no stage, uh, uh, no, no student, no uh, person who was occupying the street was saying what they were doing was legal. The, 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 the ready assumption is what they were doing was illegal. And indeed it was. It doesn't take a genius to work out that if you set up a tent right in the middle of a busy road, you can't do that. You're bound to be breaching some law. The challenge or the question mark over the rule of law was that uh, the, uh, these people were allowed to, as it were, break the law for so long uh, for politicians who came out to say, well, it was all right uh, to do that. You don't have to worry about breaking the law in these circumstances, which I, I, I'm not making a political statement here or not entering into political debate, merely highlighting the debate which then developed as a result of this incident and the earlier event, which was the white paper, causing people even now to question um, the rule of law in Hong Kong, whether somehow it had been undermined questioning whether the rule of law was as fragile an institution as that, that when you have a couple of incidents like that, people then start worrying about whether the rule of law existed in Hong Kong. And this is the theme of today's talk. The title doesn't tell you, because the title talk, it says the rule of law in changing times. But the theme which I would like to uh, develop uh, shortly uh, briefly today, is actually how fragile is the rule of law, whether in Hong Kong or in any other place, and how do you test it? Because you can't look in an incident where people break laws, or you can't look at a document like the white paper where things are said, and then say, ah, oh, well, the rule of law is at an end, or it's undermined, and so on, without asking you a more fundamental question, is actually, how do I know whether the rule of law exists in any given place? How do I test it? And that is what uh, uh, I wish to talk about. Before I do that, um, a, a brief word about what the rule of law is. Books have been written about this, and, and, and happily for you, actually, how many are doing law? Half? Over half? Just raise your hand. Now, don't worry, I won't ask any questions. <laughs> I won't pick up. Well, Andrew, that looks about half or more than half. Happily for you, you don't have to study uh, um, uh, books by Dicey and other people uh, dealing with what the rule of law means. Most of you have heard uh, of uh, Lord Bingham's book on the rule of law where this is discussed. The easiest way of understanding it for a lawyer and a non-lawyer is to adopt the ready definition. I, I summarize everything that I've learned or read, which is this. The rule of law exists where you have a set of laws which protect the rights of people, fundamental rights or human rights. And essentially, these are rights which enable people to carry on their day-to-day -day business, to earn a living, and basically to lead a dignified life. That's one part of it. The second part of it is, well, no point having such laws unless you have the means or an institution to enforce those laws, not meaning the police, but meaning the judiciary. Do you have a judiciary, or does this jurisdiction have a judiciary that enforces the laws to their full extent, both content and spirit? Now, those two make up for me uh, what the rule of law is. I mentioned Magna Carta uh, uh, at the start uh, of um, uh, this talk. 800 years this year since the sealing of the Magna Carta. Um, the Magna Carta, you'll have read, or perhaps you've seen even films about what it means. Most of you know what it means. It contains uh, uh, references to a jury, references to access to justice, and so on and so forth. But for our purposes, Magna Carta has 
three significances. The first significance uh, is that it is the foundation of the common law as we know it. Hong Kong is a common law jurisdiction. Uh, as if that was not obvious, it's actually stated in the basic law itself. The basic law is Hong Kong's constitution. The second significance of Magna Carta was that for the first time, um, the king, now for king you can substitute government, but in those days we're talking about the king, the king was subject to the law and was to be treated uh, equally, like everybody else, as being subject to the law. This is the lasting, uh, 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 the, the second lasting um, significance of Magna Carta. The third was that these rights which existed and um, to which the king was uh, subject uh, was in writing. If it's in writing, it is something uh, which can be enforced. So these are the significant parts. And they would also, therefore, define uh, what is the, or help define, what is the rule of law. And that is the lasting significance of Magna Carta. So when you hear all the celebrations which take place this year in England, and particularly in the USA, uh, you will, um, this is the significance. Now, Magna Carta is certainly regarded as more significant by American lawyers than British lawyers. British lawyers, I think, uh, look at it in a rather understated way. Not American lawyers. Who, who's from America? Anybody? Probably no one, actually. But anyway, um, uh, as far as Americans are concerned, they see Magna Carta as being the foundation of all the rights and liberties which exist in their constitution. Magna Carta is rarely, if at all, cited in British uh, judgments. There's only one I'm aware of, and this is the uh, uh, judgment of Lord Millet in, in, in the Privy Council. Uh, compare with this, um, contrast with this, uh, American jurisprudence in which in the past 60 years, Magna Carta has been referred to and used in no less than 60 judgments of the Supreme Court of the United States. They regard it as an important event. And for those who've been to Washington, D.C., as you enter uh, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, there are bronze doors on which is depicted the seating of the Magna Carta by King John. Now, all this has a modern relevance in uh, the definition of the rule of law, which um, uh, I have just mentioned. And so we get on to, uh, uh, nearer, the, the, the main theme of today, the, uh, and then that shows what the importance of the rule of law is. It's, it's important, I mean, I, I, you don't need me to tell you about that, importance, important to the way people regulate their lives. It, it balances society, it gives a cohesiveness, a cohesion to society, and as far as money is concerned, investment, it promotes economic growth. I'll be speaking tomorrow at the Global Law Summit uh, on the topic of the world, uh, global economy and the rule of law. And this is the theme, that the rule of law matters uh, to uh, economic considerations uh, and investment. So, so much for the rule of law, the importance of the rule of law, but why are people regarding it as fragile in Hong Kong as a result of these recent events. And, and people then get worried because everybody knows in Hong Kong the rule of law is important. Why? Because everybody says so. Uh, it is a major institution. The government says it is one of the strengths of Hong Kong. For anyone coming from Hong Kong, I think you will agree that the rule of law is important. Not just to Hong Kong, it's important to any society. So when you see it under threat, and when people see it as fragile, when people see it as being undermined, you start getting worried. Now, how do you actually then answer the question, does the rule of law exist in a place, or is it healthy? Now, there are a number of ways of looking at this. I have a sort of checklist, and you should have this checklist as well, if this is a topic which uh, interests you, because by going through this checklist, which is objective, you will then help at least answer for yourself the question about the existence of the rule of law. It has to be objective because that is the way lawyers are trained. All lawyers and non-lawyers know 
the only way courts decide is according to the evidence. But uh, 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 as a matter of argument, to persuade someone, you've got to look at things objectively. Now, what are these things? As far as the rule of law is concerned, first, you look at the infrastructure. The infrastructure consists of two things. That is the makeup of the courts and the contents of the laws themselves. Dealing with the contents of the law, what have we got in writing? Using Hong Kong as an example, you see that uh, under the basic law, uh, the basic law sets out a number of rights. It sets out the application of the ICCPR uh, to Hong Kong, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That's where it sets out the, the, the right of the freedom of expression, of religion, the freedom to demonstrate, the freedom, well, all the freedoms uh, with which you're familiar are set out in that document finds a legislative force in the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance. All these rights are there, what we call fundamental rights or human rights. The teeth which, is, uh, which are given to the courts um, is not just in interpreting the contents of these rights, but also to declare, in Hong Kong anyway, any laws promulgated by the government as being unconstitutional if it is contrary to these rights. And this is a significant power which the Hong, courts have, Hong Kong courts have, which not often appreciated by many people outside of Hong Kong, the ability of the courts to declare acts or statutes void if they are seen to be unconstitutional. This is not a right which exists in this country, in, in, in the United Kingdom, or Australia, or New Zealand. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, under the HRA, the Human Rights Act, uh, 1998, the most that the courts can do is to make a declaration of unconstitutionality, leaving it to the government to, as it were, do the right thing and uh, repeal the laws. But it hasn't got the power to do that uh, by itself. Uh, whereas in Hong Kong, the court can actually say this law is a void and of no effect. Now, this is what exists uh, in writing. The other part of the infrastructure, of course, is how the courts are meant to operate. Under the basic law, there are many provisions, but I just go through perhaps two or three. The most important one is judicial independence. Judicial independence is stipulated in the basic law in three places. So uh, not once, not twice, but three times, I think makes the point that uh, Hong Kong is to have judicial independence. The appointment of judges, although the appointing agency is the chief executive himself, I'm afraid you, you, a lot of people make political leeway out of the fact, ah, oh, chief executive appoints the judges, therefore uh, the government must be in control of who becomes a judge, tells, I'm afraid, not the whole story, because the appointing agency, of course, is the chief executive. Somebody has to make the appointment and sign the necessary documents. But the procedure is that judges are recommended to be judges by an independent judicial commission. This was the position before 1997, and this is the same system which uh, uh, carried through beyond 1997. It's recommended by this independent commission chaired by the Chief Justice comprising judges, lay people, members of the bar, and uh, the law society. Uh, and in every case uh, I've ever known, uh, every recommendation is taken up by the chief executive. At no stage does the chief executive say, I don't think this person ought to be a judge, or I think that person ought to be made a judge. So uh, the appointing system is such that it should engender uh, confidence. The setup of our courts uh, comprises lawyers from, well, common law jurisdictions, uh, obviously within Hong Kong. The only qualifications for a judge are uh, his or her professional and judicial qualities. These are the only two um, uh, uh, criteria uh, which are stated in the basic law. So when you have requirements or, or a desire that judges should be patriotic, well, that's not in the basic law. And, and it's, it, it's, it sits very oddly. The only qualifications are professional 
and legal qualities. Now, this is the position, therefore, in writing. So in writing, you have an ideal setup, judicial independence, rights and liberties, uh, as, you know, uh, as you know them, fully set out. But what of the practice? Because you have to be convinced that in practice, these laws are enforced and given their full measure and worth. Now, when you, and here, you're there, the focus is therefore on the courts. Do the courts enforce these rights, and do the courts do so independently? Now, how are you going to actually test that? It's not tested by listening to people tell you yes or no. Um, for every person who tells you yes, like me, there will be others who say, well, maybe no. The only way you decide that, as with all things, is to look at objective indicators. The most important objective indicator is what I call transparency of the courts and what the courts do. Transparency comes in two important forms. First is easy to comprehend. Uh, all court proceedings are open to the public. You can see what goes on. There are many jurisdictions uh, uh, around the world where you are not allowed to observe most court proceedings. In fact, across the border uh, in the, on the mainland, uh, uh, proceedings are not open uh, to the public. Contrast Hong Kong, where every, proceedings, uh, every proceeding is open to the public except those which are particularly sensitive, say involving children uh, and so on. These are recognized exceptions uh, all over the world. So that's one aspect of transparency. The other aspect, and this is important, and this uh, is, is you, you, you often, uh, as law students, you have to read through um, decided cases. And the complaint, usually among students, is that they're too long. Um, they contain a lot of, uh, a uh, lot of pages, um, but it serves this purpose, which you, you should bear in mind. It sets out in great detail precisely how the court has reached a result in the particular case. It, of course, shows to the immediate parties why the court decided the way it did. It enables the losing party, of course, then to say, oh, I think you've got this wrong, so I'm going to go on appeal. I'm not talking about that situation, but looking wider uh, to the world at large and other people looking at such judgments, which are, in fact, published and open to the public. There, the public, and indeed the whole world, can see that the court has decided matters strictly in accordance with the law. Now, of course, the contents of the law I've discussed, so people need to be convinced that you have only that is the court, the judge, decided the matter according to law as opposed to any other consideration. The courts decide many types of cases. In the public law sphere, it decides cases which have a political background and which are highly political in nature. People who look at results only will say, ah, of course the courts decided that way because the courts may be biased towards the government or biased against the government. Only by looking at the reasoning of the courts contained in these long judgments that all of you have to read, can you then see that the court has done the exact opposite of that and decided only strictly according to the law. Now this is important because it is important for people to have the confidence in, 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 in the courts to see that the courts have done the one thing required of them, which is to fulfill their constitutional uh, mandate. And this is what I mean by transparency. So this is a, 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 an important indicator in Hong Kong or in any other jurisdiction. See, in jurisdiction, some jurisdictions, you don't really have uh, detailed reasons given uh, or judgments. In those sort of jurisdictions, it gives rise to a speculation, sometimes true, that the court has decided the matter take into account considerations other than the law. Namely, perhaps uh, the judge may be corrupt, maybe the political considerations have been taken into account, and so on uh, and so forth. So these, th that's one important indicator, uh, transparency. 
The second important indicator you could say, well, all right, uh, ask, um, uh, ask people who use the system, lawyers and otherwise, what their feel, their gut reaction is to the existence of the rule of law in, that, uh, in any particular jurisdiction. Not, not a very scientific way of doing it, but I think nevertheless an objective indicator. The third, and, and this is, I don't attach too much importance to this myself, but other people would, is to look at the results of cases decided by the courts in the public law sphere, in other words, cases which involve government. Are you there, does the government always win? Does the government always lose? If the government wins every time, then you might think, well, actually, I think the courts may be a bit biased here. If the courts, uh, if the government loses every time, uh, then you might think uh, the opposite. In other words, a political consideration. Now, for myself, I don't think it's important because if you make an assumption that the courts only decide according to law, it doesn't matter who really wins or loses. Uh, the result doesn't matter because the court is decided according to law. But I can see that as a useful indicator if you have doubts about, if you're asking the fundamental question, are the courts uh, deciding uh, according to law uh, 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 anyway? So these are the uh, important indicators. The other important indicator is to ask, well, who sits on the courts? Uh, what type of judges? I mean, in Hong Kong, we have in the Court of Final Appeal, not just judges from Hong Kong, but there is always one, always one judge uh, from, the, um, uh, from, from an overseas common law jurisdiction. And at the moment, we have a lot of distinguished jurists sitting uh, in the Court of Final Appeal, as, as many of you know. So the, the, the current president of the, uh, um, uh, current president uh, of the Supreme Court, Lord Newberger, sits. The, immediate past president of the Supreme Court also sits. Uh, legal giants like Lord uh, Walker, Lord Hoffman also sit. That's a sort of objective indicator as well uh, as to um, the existence uh, of uh, the rule of law. So there may be other objective indicators that you could think about. I'm not going to go into others. You can think for, uh, for yourselves. I end by actually taking as an example the recent Occupy Movement litigation, which resulted in injunctions granted uh, by the courts. In those cases where the, the government did actually go to court, these were cases in which bus companies, taxi operators, <laughs> Uh, 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 owners of buildings adjacent to these streets went to court to sue under the tort, uh, based on the tort of private nuisance against the protesters, uh, against the occupants of the streets. Uh, the court of first instance listened to argument for a number of days, eventually came up with the decision that injunctions would be granted. Appeal uh, applications for leave to appeal were sought the Court of Appeal refused. Also, in both cases, that is, uh, in, in all cases, both before the Court of First Instance and the Court of Appeal, reasoned ju uh, reason judgments, reasoned decisions came out so that everybody could see that the courts were not politically no motivated or biased in the context of a litigation which itself was highly politically motivated. I mean, the Occupy movement is, is a political, uh, had, a, had a political uh, basis. It was highly political, but not the way the courts dealt with it. And it's important uh, to see that. At all stages, the legal reasoning of the courts was apparent uh, for all to see. And add on to that also an access to justice uh, dimension. Uh, the plaintiffs, that is the building owners, the bus operators, uh, taxi drivers had, of course, experienced counsel and senior counsel, but then so did the protesters, the students and other occupiers. They had senior counsel acting for them. They couldn't afford them uh, because obviously they were students, but legal aid was provided for them. So it's important, therefore, uh, to see that there was access to justice uh, there. And that's the sort of 
thing you should be looking at uh, uh, when you examine any particular situation, uh, whenever you're faced with uh, any question mark over the rule of law in Hong Kong, indeed elsewhere, ask yourself properly and ask yourself objectively um, uh, uh, those matters which go towards supporting uh, the rule of law and then come up with the answer. And the answer I hope you come up with uh, after all the recent events in Hong Kong is that uh, you'll come to the view that perhaps a rule of law is not quite as delicate or fragile as all that and that it is something which does exist in Hong Kong and has not been undermined. But not for me to persuade you but for you to make up your mind. And that is the process of thought I'd like each and every one of you to embark on, um, uh, rather than to, as I say, uh, uh, agree with my views. Come up with your own views, but I just hope uh, you will leave this room uh, with that approach in mind, because I think that is the right approach for you and indeed anybody else in Hong Kong. Thank you. I've been, um, uh, that's a good uh, uh, question. Um, I've been concerned with what the courts, uh, how the courts deal with matters. And that, of course, that's the main part which concerns me. I fully appreciate that law and the culture of the rule of law applies to other institutions as well. I can't really answer for those, constitution, uh, those institutions except to say this, that guided by how the court itself approaches questions on the rule of law, on how it interprets laws. For example, rights are to be interpreted generously, so that uh, that's what is meant by the spirit of the uh, rule of law. You're looking at the spirit behind laws, not just the words themselves. You hope that the way that the court, uh, uh, the attitude of the court, as shown by its judgments, will then governed by uh, the way these other institutions operate. The court has no means of monitoring uh, how these other institutions operate until the matter gets to court. I do not say for one moment that the courts have the final say uh, as to enforcing the law because it does depend uh, the enforcement of the law and a respect for the rule of law um, uh, has to be a culture which exists in these other institutions. Um, it, it's a hard question to answer because I'm afraid uh, the judiciary or the courts can't control the way these institutions work until there is a matter before the courts. The lady at the Um, and you also mentioned at the beginning of your uh, discussion or talk that 
more or less all countries face similar issues. Uh, but it's only their way, if I may have understood correctly, of implementation which varies or differs. Could you please enlighten us a bit about how these Commonwealth countries, which have inherited a particular system, are unsuccessful in implementing the system which the originator has successfully, or to some extent, been successful? Mm. Um, you, you, you asked a question which involves both the contents of laws, whether they recognize the full extent of what we extend, understand to be human rights, and the way it is enforced. Now, um, let, let's start the other way around, which is the way it is enforced. A court which looks merely at the wording of laws without looking at a wider picture is taking an unduly narrow view. Now, let, let me give an example of that uh, by reference to um, uh, a case decided by the Privy Council from one of the uh, from, from one of the Commonwealth. Actually, I can't remember where it was. I think it's probably uh, West Indies, and it was a judgment of Lord Millard. I'm afraid I can't uh, name the judgment. That was a case where the statute itself did not provide. Uh, a certain right which one would assume existed. It was a procedural right of access to be given due process. Uh, I think it involved an execution as well. Um, uh, and the position taken by the government of that particular country was that, well, I'm sorry, uh, whereas other constitutions would have this uh, procedural right, um, uh, 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 our constitution did not. The way the court dealt with it, the Privy Council, was actually, this was the case which referred to Magna Carta, uh, by saying that Magna Carta had as a principle access to justice, the right to due process. And that wasn't dependent on what a constitution or indeed a uh, statute would say. That was part of the common law. And if you are you, you, you mentioned Commonwealth countries. If you are a member of the Commonwealth, then you have, as the foundation of your law, as Hong Kong does, as many other jurisdictions uh, have, the foundation is the common law. And if it's the common law you're looking at, you look at materials such as the Magna Carta to say, well, due process is there. Now, some may say, well, that's stretching it a bit. Others would say, and I think rightly so, this is the culture of the common law. Not everything uh, can be written, not everything has to be written, but this is the spirit of the law which has to be applied. Now, this then plugs um, uh, holes which may exist in certain, uh, uh, um, uh, in the legislation or the constitutions of various places. But it's a, it's a process not just of the legislation, but of the enforcement agency, which in this case means the courts. If the courts takes the view, I'm sorry, it's not there in writing, it, it, it's in writing, I'm afraid, in, in, in say the Bahamas Constitution, therefore it doesn't apply in our case, even though it, it, it is a fundamental right, then that court is taking an unduly narrow view. That, that, that is my view of it. So it depends on the court itself and the culture of that court. And it's important for the court, it, it, when you're looking at particularly fundamental rights that affect people's livelihood or even their safety and health, to take a liberal view. That's why you'll see, if you're a student of constitutional law, all courts ought to be construing fundamental rights in a generous way, in a purposive way. Uh, I often like taking the example that um, the freedom of expression, the freedom to demonstrate is a valuable right uh, but it's, if you say that the right is restricted to no more than three people demonstrating, then you are emasculating that right and you're not complying with the spirit. The spirit of the law, the spirit, if you like, of the common law is all important. It's not a theory. This is actually very much a practical uh, matter. Of course, you can't do the same if you're looking at a company statute. You can't use back the Carter to say, ah, oh, right, okay, uh, I'll give minority shareholders uh, greater rights than what's allowed. You're looking, w w I think w we're talking in the context of uh, human rights and fundamental rights. Can I take some questions? 
together. So if I take a free question from that, uh, um, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, regarding the um, how fragile is rule of law in Hong Kong, I believe that what I address, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, from the indicators that you suggested, it seems like you have a very you have an emphasis on objectivity and even transparency of judgments. For example, look at racial based agenda in, in each judgment. But then my question would be, um, take, t uh, take an ex example of law and um, in the Hai ha Chu case, for example, it has a lot of um, reasonings and it's very transparent. But then, although he is trying to apply the legal rules, but he is in fact creating um, rules and may, um, if I'm allowed to speak it in Cantonese, Yi Fa Ba Yi. So he's trying to achieve justice in in developing the law, and by in, in somehow it's some of his um, subjective values, for example, intuitions or values that he, he thinks is very important. Now this pro this is the problem that Hong Kong is now facing: is that um, rule of law is very fragile in the sense that each um, judicial um, agent has a particular agenda and trying to achieve justice through law. And that's the problem um, when the balance is tilted, especially when people, whatever people do, are, seems to be right. And whatever the government does is all wrong. So this kind of um, imbalance or um, actually somehow bias, I think um, reasoning for judgment can't really solve the problem. Do you have any other suggestions to solve the um, precise problem that Hong Kong is now facing? Well, uh, I think um, uh, a part of your question certainly requires a political answer, which uh, is, is really not for me to give, nor am I qualified to give that. Uh, but uh, insofar as it involves a legal consideration uh, uh, of, of the matter, um, in looking at the legal solution to a legal problem, the courts are not going to look at any political considerations. Uh, because you mentioned about, oh, uh, some people say the government's always wrong, uh, or some people say the government's always right, uh, or politicians talk in all sorts of ways, even those politicians who are lawyers talk in non-legal terms, but in political terms. But as far as the court is concerned, one is looking always and at all times in the law. You mentioned Lord Denning uh, in High Trees and how he sought to develop uh, 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 equitable principles there. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, indeed admirable, because what Lord Denning is doing and others like him was applying the law. He wasn't applying some other concept which is alien to the law and which is outside the law, such as a political uh, consideration. So um, it's not for the courts to provide political solutions to political problems but it is the courts are there to provide legal solutions to problems which may emanate from political problems. I mean, the Occupy movement litigation is a good example of that because that was um, litigation in a highly political context, but decided, this is the point I tried to make, but decided by the courts strictly according to the law. And I think the courts, hopefully, will be seen by many people to have come out very well at the end of it, because what the courts did was to decide that mat these matters according to law, as opposed to exhibit any political bias. <clears throat> um, yeah, so um, I have two related questions. Um, one is, um, as you said, many um, people criticise the court um, as regards to the injunction about the Occupy Central movement um, clearance that the court was biased in the injunction. But at the same time, uh, many, especially in the pro-establishment um, camps, also criticised the students and the protesters and the participants of the Occupy Central movement as being um, violating the rule of law as well because they have occupied, um, you know, the roles for, you know, conservatively two months. And um, what your, what is your view um, with regards to this, you know, argument? Do you, do you think that the students actually uh, violating the rule of law themselves as well? And the related question to that is that, um, as you mentioned, the Magna Carta 
uh, the spirit, as I would interpret it, is that the Manakasha um, spirit is to restrain the government and to subject the government and the people in power under the law and uh, subject to the rule of law. Do you think that this, the spirit of the rule of law, um, restrains the government more than the people, or do you think, or do you think it's vice versa? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you're right to say these are two related questions, and I'll try to answer sort of both of them uh, at the same time. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are critics of the, uh, of the courts in the way they decided uh, the, the Occupy Central uh, cases. Uh, those who supported the students uh, would say, well, the courts um, got it wrong. Oh, that was the answer. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, there are those of, I, of course, I, I hear those criticisms made of the court. Uh, there are those who would criticize the court if the courts didn't grant the injunctions. And in fact, the court didn't grant certainly the injunctions uh, that were sought. Now, here, this is important because you've raised um, uh, an important point. The rule of law, whether it exists, is not dependent on the result of the case. It is a mistake, I think, uh, and this is a mistake which a lot of lawyers, as well as sometimes uh, even academics, fall into, which is to look at the results in cases in order to determine whether the rule of law exists. Put it as simplest. Um, people then say, ah, when the courts hold against the government, the rule of law um, is, is, is healthy because the courts have made a stand against the government. That's what Magna Carta stood for. However, if the courts hold in favor of government, um, well, the rule of law is undermined uh, because you've held in favor of a government which Magna Carta uh, sought to control. That, I think, is an entirely wrong way of looking at it. The result of a case is always going to be, people are going to be divided on this. Uh, because if you're involved yourself in litigation, if the court holds against you, you're not going to be happy with the result. If there is a, a, a court case which says everybody in this room from now on is going to have to pay double uh, their university tuition fees, nobody's going to like that result. But that's nothing to do with whether the rule of law has been undermined. It is undermined if you you have to go beyond that and look at the legal reasoning or the reasoning of the courts. The process here, in, the words, in other words, matters when you're considering the rule of law. If the court has decided the matter completely in accordance with the law and therefore um, attaining its constitutional mandate, that is therefore not worrying for the rule of law. What is worrying if the court doesn't fulfill its constitutional mandate and has decided the case yeah, uh, um, take into account considerations which are not related to the law. Um, uh, uh, that is the greater worry. I don't seek to persuade people to be happy with the actual result of what the courts decide. You may not, actually not be happy with certain results of cases which have been decided, but the importance here, since we're talking about the rule of law, is in the process itself. And I would like to think that much as you disagree perhaps with a result, say much as some people would disagree with the granting of the injunctions against the occupiers, that nobody would say, ah, but um, the rule of law has been undermined, or that the courts have decided the matter in accordance with something other than the law. It's important to bear this in mind, because otherwise you are forever uh, labeling courts as conservative, fascist, liberal, uh, and so on. I mean, there was a study made. Uh, um, uh, there's an article made by a student, I think in Hong Kong U or Chinese University, uh, analyzing my judgments. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> it's all right. I, that, 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 that's, uh, and I'm perfectly happy uh, um, for that to be done uh, and cri criticisms to be made. But the question which was sought to be addressed um, was this, that does, do the courts under um, 
well, during the time I've been Chief Justice so far, exhibit a tendency to be pro-Beijing. In other words, the way that question is asked is, does, are the courts biased uh, towards um, Beijing? And the conclusion uh, uh, which was arrived at by that student, actually, is, I can't remember the publication, the conclusion arrived at was, oh, a question mark looms over Chief Justice Ma's court as to whether this is so. And that alarms me if that is the view of people because it indicates that people think that the court may be biased. But when one examines closely the argument which supports that theory, uh, they are looking merely at the result of cases, of cases decided for or against government, or cases which have uh, a, a mainland Chinese uh, content. And that, I think, is the wrong way of looking at it. It is the process and the reasoning which matters. I have just one final question. Yeah. Um, hello, um, Chief Justice Ma. Uh, just now you mentioned that one of um, the indicators. Oh. <laughs> And we heard from the newspaper that actually there are um, um, criticisms or questions by the former chairman of a Hong Kong Bar Association that saying that um, the repeated emphasis on the rule of law by the government, and um, also he also thinks that uh, the government has confused the idea of rule of law and rule by law. And so my questions, I have two questions. First of all, to what extent uh, do you think that at least the perception that uh, the rule of law in Hong Kong is fragile. The Hong Kong government has to um, be held responsible for that perception. Secondly, uh, how do you evaluate the silent march of a large number of lawyers after the release of the white paper last year? Thank you. Right. Um, Bearing in mind that I'm not going to make a political comment uh, on, on this, I mean, I'm not in a position to second guess the government, um, nor am I going to make a comment one way or the other what the government um, has done or not done. I mean, my views on the rule of law uh, are, I hope, the views which would be generally held by anybody who examines this subject. Now, I would say this, however, that the rule of law doesn't mean that, ah, people have got to obey the law. Uh, it's not as simple as that. It is as, if you like, complicated in the way that I've explained it. Uh, it, it is not about simply saying, because someone breaks the law, therefore the rule of law uh, 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 suffers. I, I, I don't think you can put it that way. The rule of law, in the way I've defined it, suffers if most of the people it can never be all the people in a society. If most of the people in a society, knowing what it means, doesn't respect it. And I have said this, I've said this actually, uh, uh, both during the opening of the legal year and during the press conference afterwards, that most people in Hong Kong respect the rule of law, respected the rule of law before the Occupy movement, during the Occupy movement, and after the Occupy movement. I've been accused in a, in, a, in a newspaper article of not knowing the difference between the rule of law and mere obedience to a law, but that's, well, not my mistake, but the mistake of the uh, uh, reporter. Was there another question? I took so long in answering your question, I forgot your second question. <laughs> Of the release of the white paper. Well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to answer that simply because many people marched uh, for different uh, reasons. But let's put it this way. The concerns shown about the white paper are those concerns which I've mentioned earlier on. The reference to judges as administrators seems to give, uh, I mean, some people think it means judges aren't deciding according to law. They, they are like civil servants uh, having to act in accordance with what the government wants. Also references in the white paper to patriotism. I've explained what the worry there uh, is. The worry is that somehow judges have to be 
biased uh, um, uh, in, in their approach. Well, thank you very much. That um, brings the formal questions to an end. So um, I. Thank you so much. Look, you're going to answer.